Freshman Congresswomen Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar prove the age-old maxim. At bottom, all political problems are theological problems. We will examine the politics of religion, the religion of politics, from Palestinian rockets to Pennsylvania mosques to gospel hymns for the Green New Deal. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. Major violence in Israel over the weekend. Big takeaways here are prominent Democrats in the United States are blaming the victims and they are siding with terrorists against a United States ally. The reason why is that all politics is ultimately about religion. Every political question, I know you think it might not be, every political question ultimately boils down to a theological question. We'll see why in a second, but first, we're never gonna agree on everything I think we can agree, however, that we could all use more sleep. I certainly could. I only got 17 hours last night. Getting a great night's sleep is easier and more affordable than you think. You don't need a new expensive mattress or sleeping pills. You just need to change your sheets. That's why you should check out Bowl & Branch. Everything Bowl & Branch makes, from bedding to blankets, is made from 100% pure organic cotton, which means they start out super soft and they get even softer over time. I used to sleep basically on sandpaper. Then I got these sheets. They are so unbelievable. They feel, I've, I've stayed at a really, really nice hotel like twice in my life, and it feels just like that. I didn't realize you could get them at home because luxury sheets can cost up to a thousand bucks in the store. With Bowl and Branch, they're only a couple hundred bucks. They cut out the middleman, send them right to you. Everyone who tries Bowl and Branch loves them. That's why they have thousands of five star reviews. Even three U.S. presidents sleep on Bowl and Branch sheets. Treat yourself like a president. Shipping is free. You can try them for 30 nights. If you don't love them, send them back for a refund, but I doubt that you'll want to send them back. There's no risk and no reason not to give them a try. To get started, right now my listeners get $50 off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com. Promo code Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Go to bowlandbranch.com today for $50 off your first set of sheets. B-O-L-L and branch.com. Promo code Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, bowlandbranch.com, promo code Michael. Major violence erupting in Israel. Ultimately, this story, the story out of Pennsylvania, the story with AOC and the Green New Deal, all of this boils down to a religious question. So what specifically is happening? In Israel, Islamic terrorists in Gaza launched over 600 rockets at Israel. Iron Dome, which is their defense system, was able to intercept 173 of those rockets. Obviously, it's not going to intercept all of them. Four people at least have been killed. Dozens have been wounded. Why is the violence breaking out? I think the the Israel-Palestine Middle Eastern conflict is so complicated. It goes back so far. It involves so many religious questions. I think a lot of Americans just say, all right, I don't want any. I don't want anything to do with it. Never mind. I don't care. I don't. Who who knows? It's very complicated. Fair enough. You can at least understand a few pieces of it because it's not just about Israel. It's not just about the Arabs in Israel and outside of Israel. It's not just about the other countries in the region. This involves the United States as well. How so? The big cause here for this attack, I believe is that Donald Trump is no longer kowtowing to the Iranian regime, to the illegitimate mullah Islamic regime in Iran. He's no longer sending them pallets full of cash on airplanes like Barack Obama did. He's no longer thanking them for abducting our sailors like Obama did. He is taking a hard line. He has a very strong national security advisor in John Bolton, and they are saying, no, we're not going to be pushed around by this thug illegitimate regime in Iran. Deal with it. So the U- U.S., when, uh, when Trump came into power, got us out of that awful Iran deal, hampered Iran's ability to get a weapon, and reinstituted sanctions against the Iranian regime. Meanwhile, our ally Israel has targeted Iranian interests in Syria, and they have gone after uh, uh, Iranian interests in direct military strikes. So now what Iran has been doing is saying that they're going to strike back at both the U.S. and Israel through proxies. So they're going to use groups like Hamas in Gaza. They're going to use groups like Islamic Jihad. They're going to use the terrorist groups that they have funded for decades. And they're going to strike at U.S. interests and they're going to strike at our ally in Israel. 
So what is the United States doing? Now the United States has deployed an aircraft carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group and a bomber task force to the region to send a message that we are not going to take provocation lying down. John Bolton, one of the greatest characters in the history of American diplomacy, came out and he issued a, a message to Iran. He said, quote, the United States is not seeking war with the Iranian regime, but we are fully prepared to respond to any attack, whether by proxy, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or regular Iranian forces. So the violence begins, in particular, how? The violence begins when a terrorist group called Islamic Jihad used a sniper to shoot Israeli troops and wounded two of those Israeli troops last week. That's what began this spate of violence. Then there was, there were repercussions to that. Then there were rockets fired from Gaza. And, and then you get this violence that we've seen now for five or six days. How did members of Congress in the United States respond to this? Well, two members in particular, Democrat members, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, those freshman representatives, far left wing, how did they respond? They defended the terrorists, of course. First, Rashida Tlaib retweeted someone who was criticizing a New York Times story. So the tweet that she retweeted said, quote, this is a stunningly irresponsible and misleading headline, New York Times. Israel shot dozens of unarmed Palestinian protesters in Gaza on Friday and killed four Palestinians, including two protesters in Gaza before any projectiles were launched. Okay, now that tweet that Rashida Tlaib retweeted is itself misleading because what it's suggesting is that Israel provoked the rocket attacks. Israel didn't provoke the rocket attacks. Iran acting through Islamic Jihad provoked the response from Israel, which then led to rocket attacks because a terrorist sniper started firing on Israeli troops. So what this person is suggesting is that when terrorists from Gaza start firing on Israeli troops, what Israel should do is nothing. They should just take it lying down. No, come on, we shouldn't. It would be wrong to fight back against terrorists shooting our troops. That's what that lunatic says. But the more troubling thing is that a member of the United States Congress then retweeted that Islamist propaganda. Now, Tlaib keeps pushing the propaganda, okay. She then pushes her own tweet, it says, quote, when will the world stop dehumanizing our Palestinian people who just want to be free? I'll just pause there for a second. Did you catch that? Our Palestinian people? Are we talking about some group of Palestinian Arabs living in New Jersey or some group of Palestinian Arabs living in Arizona? No. Who are our Palestinian people? Who does Tlaib refer to as our? Who does she view as us? Who is she allying herself with? Our people who just want to be free. The tweet goes on. Headlines like this and framing it in this way just feed into the continued lack of responsibility on Israel who unjustly oppress and target Palestinian children and families. Hashtag free Palestine. So this is pure terrorist propaganda. It's the only way to put it. A member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, is, has become a mouthpiece for some of the worst terrorists in the world. That's, you know, I don't, there's no more diplomatic way I could say it. And listen, the, the more interesting thing, I mean, I've, I've suspected this for a long time with Rashida Tlaib. It's clear she doesn't like Israel. It's clear she doesn't like Jews. And it's clear that she sides with some of the worst terrorists in the world. But l listen to the language. She cho she's siding with a group, these, this group of Arabs in so-called Palestine that elected Hamas to be their government, that elected a terrorist organization to be their government. She's siding with them over an actual ally and a Western-style democracy in the Middle East. But the language, free Palestine, the people just want to be free. We've talked about this theme for weeks now, this theme that goes throughout all of Western modernity, which is liberation, emancipation. We always want to emancipate. We always want to liberate. We always want to be free. Free is good, not free is bad. Who could disagree with that? Well, what happens when freedom means the opposite of freedom? 
This is why you've always got to watch out for people who only speak in the terms of abstract rights. Human rights, liberty, equality, fraternity. Whenever they're just talking in those totally abstract terms that are not connected to anything on the ground, that are not connected to actual legal rights, that are not connected to actual people in actual places with actual institutions, when they're just using those words, chances are they're demagogues. Chances are they're trying to trick you. When she says free, she means Arabs in this region get another state. That's what she, they just want to be free. How many Muslim states are there in the region? How many dozens of Muslim states are there in the region? There's one Jewish state in the world. There are dozens of Muslim states in that region. And now she's saying we need to take away part of the Jewish state to have another Muslim state. Otherwise, these Arabs can't be free. Okay, now, now what would that state look like? If let's, let's just totally indulge the left's preference here and say we're going to give them freedom, we're going to give them a state. What would that state look like? We'll get to it in a second. But first, admit it. You think that cybercrime is something that happens to other people. Not you. Nobody wants your data, right? Hackers can't possibly grab your passwords or credit card details, but you'd be wrong. Stealing data from unsuspecting people on public Wi-Fi is one of the simplest and cheapest ways for hackers to make money. And something tells me that you probably look at some pretty weird websites on the internet. You probably look at some sites that you wouldn't want to get out in the public. You know what I'm talking about? Late at night, you close the blinds, turn the lights off, read The Daily Wire. Yeah, I think we understand each other. You could be writing your passwords and credit card numbers on a huge billboard for the rest of the world to see which is why I decided to take action to protect myself. I use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. ExpressVPN uses easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer phone or tablet. Turning it on, it takes just one click using ExpressVPN. You can safely surf on public Wi-Fi without being snooped on, without having your personal data stolen for less than seven bucks a month. You can get the same protection that I have. ExpressVPN is the number one VPN service by TechRadar. Uh, rated by TechRadar comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash Michael. That is E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Michael for three months free with a one-year package. Expressvpn.com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, to learn more. Let's take Rashida Tlaib's tweet on the surface. Just at its face value. They want to be free, and to be free, they need a state. What would that state look like? It would be a state run by Hamas. You would be giving the terrorist organization Hamas, which targets civilians, doesn't just accidentally kill civilians, targets civilians, women and children, uses them as bulletproof vests, not bulletproof for the women and children, uses them as, as protection from bombs and guns. You would be giving them a, a country. Free would mean a free free Palestine would mean giving international recognition to a, a group of people that intentionally undermine the international order. You'd be giving a nation to people who undermine our system of nation states. It is a freedom that would undercut everybody else's freedom. Ilhan Omar actually goes further than Rashida Tlaib. She tweets out, quote, how many more protesters must be shot, rockets must be fired, and little kids must be killed until the endless cycle of violence ends. The status quo of occupation and humanitarian crisis in Gaza is unsustainable. Only real justice can bring about security and lasting peace. How many more protesters must be shot? How many more rockets must be fired? I don't know. Tell the people in Gaza to stop firing rockets. It's up to them, not up to Israel. They're the ones firing the rockets. They're the ones killing the little kids. It's not an endless cycle of violence necessarily. It's an endless cycle of violence because terrorists in Gaza keep firing on a legitimate state. And, and in part, uh, the only blame that Israel deserves in this is that they haven't simply wiped out that government of Hamas, that terrorist organization, completely. That they haven't just strung up every single one of those filthy terrorists one after another. That's, that's the, the only blame that Israel deserves in this case is that they haven't been harsher on Hamas terrorists. Now, what, what Israel is saying is we can't be harsher on Hamas terrorists because Hamas terrorists are using civilians as human shields. And so we don't want to kill all of these civilians. Fair enough. Honorable position to hold. But the endless cycle of violence is being 
uniformly pushed by terrorist Islamists in Hamas in, and, and other terrorist organizations in that region. How many more, how many more rockets is Islamic Jihad going to launch? Blaming the victim. That's what Omar is doing. That's what Talib is doing. So why are they siding with the terrorists? The reason they're siding with the terrorists is that all political problems ultimately are theological problems. Ultimately, what, what it seems to me, judging from Ilhan Omar's tweets, for instance, judging from statements that they've made, judging from them giggling at Islamic terrorist organizations, what it seems to me is they are denying Jews claim to Israel. They're denying Jews religious claim to Israel, and they are denying Jews historical claim to Israel. The, re the religion, the, the people in the religion have informed the history of that region, and so they deny the historical claim. Now, historically, Muslims have also made a claim to Jerusalem. What is the Muslim claim to Jerusalem? A lot of people don't know this because most people haven't read the Quran. The Muslim claim to Jerusalem is a little weaker than the Jewish claim to Jerusalem. The Muslim claim to Jerusalem is that one night Muhammad was mystically lifted up from Mecca and he was transported on a mythical creature to Jerusalem. And then there are all these other things that kind of seem like fever dreams that come out of it. So the claim is he was mystically on a, on a winged horse brought from Mecca to Jerusalem. We don't have any evidence, of course, that a winged horse brought Muhammad to Jerusalem, but that is the claim. It's based on a story in the Quran. So the political question boils down to religion. Which religious group has a claim to the land? And, and moreover, what is the difference between Jews and Arabs in the region? You're talking about two different peoples in exactly the same place. And yet they have very different societies, very different cultures. Why is that? Is it some racial issue? Is it that Arabs are just less able to govern themselves than ethnic Jews? I don't think so. I don't think there's any evidence for that. Is it even culture primarily? I don't know. What, what is culture? Culture comes from cult. Culture comes from, the, the two words, by the way, culture and cult, are linked etymologically. They both come from the same place. What it means is it's like Andrew Breitbart said, politics is downstream from culture. Culture is downstream of what the culture worships, religion. So you've got these two religions. You've got the, the people informed by Judaism and, and in, also from the West, which was formed by Judaism, but, and also Christianity and also Greek philosophy. And you've got a culture that is informed by Islam. And they form different peoples. They form different politics. They form different claims to land. And they form different alliances. So the strategic question for the United States is, who would we rather ally ourselves with? Would we rather ally ourselves with Israel or with Hamas? Would you rather ally yourself with Bibi Netanyahu, who during the administration of Barack Obama was the leader of the free world, or would you rather ally yourself with Hamas terrorists? Western-style democracy or Islamist rogue pseudo-states? What would you rather ally yourself with? You can make the religious question even more tangible. If you look, move out of uh, Israel and you go to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia chapter of the Muslim American Society posted a video over the past few days of little kids talking about chopping off heads. I'll narrate this because they're singing in Arabic. These are kids maybe six, 12 years old, and they're singing. Those who accept humiliation, what is the point in their existence? Those who reject oppression are the ones who assert their existence. And they eliminate injustice from the land of the Arabs. Rebels, rebels, rebels. They're wearing Palestinian uh, headscarves as well. Glorious steeds call us and lead us onto paths leading to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. The blood of martyrs protects us. Paradise needs real men. The land of the Prophet Muhammad's night journey is calling us, Jerusalem. Our Palestine must return to us. O Saladin, your men are among us. Shame will be washed away. You need force in the Quran, O free people. We must per persevere no matter what happens. And with the help of the omnipotent Lord, day will follow night. Take us, O ships, until we liberate our lands. Until we reach our shores and crush the treacherous ones. Blow, O winds of paradise, flow, O rivers of martyrs. 
My Islam is calling. Who is going to heed its call? Rise, O righteous ones. Our martyrs sacrificed their lives without hesitation. They attained paradise, and the scent of musk emanates from their bodies. They compete with one another to reach paradise. Will Jerusalem be their capital city, or will it be a hotbed for cowards? They mean Jews, by the way. We will defend the land of divine guidance with our bodies, and we will sacrifice our souls without hesitation. We will chop off their heads, and we will liberate the sorrowful and exalted Al-Aqsa Mosque. We will lead the army of Allah, fulfilling his promise, and we will subject them to eternal torture. Six to 12-year-old kids posted by a mosque in Philadelphia, not in Jerusalem, not in Gaza, not, nope, not in Mecca, Philadelphia. This is being posted by the Muslim American Society. Now, the person who posted that allegedly has been fired. The president of the Muslim American Society, the executive director, says, this video does not represent our understanding of Islam, nor the understanding of the mainstream Muslim community. I hope that's true. I don't know if it's true. It's pretty weird that they would post that video. It's pretty weird that that video exists. This is the religious question. So in America, we, we always ignore the, the actual religious question. We ignore the deep questions of our politics. In part, it's because our system is built on religious freedom. But part of that religious freedom is that we won't stop, start chopping off each other's heads. Part of that religious freedom is a tacit agreement among all of us that we won't do what those little six-year-olds in the video are singing about and chop off people's heads and, uh, and exult in their blood. If religious freedom encourages people to start chopping off people's heads for believing in Christianity or Judaism, you have undercut the entire point of that religious freedom. G.K. Chesterton has this line. He wrote, there is a thought that stops thought, and that is the only thought that ought to be stopped. There is a religious freedom that stops religious freedom. What, how could that possibly be true religious freedom? At a certain point in the conversation, when you're talking about politics and culture and religion, the phrase religious freedom is not enough. In our culture, we're so into this right now. We say, you do you. Don't yuck my yum. Well, that's your, you, you can do whatever you want to do, and I'll do whatever I want to do, and we don't need to talk about the thing itself. All we'll, we're just talking about freedom. We're all free. We can do whatever we want. You sometimes have to get to the ideas themselves. Politics is down from culture. Culture is down from religion. And sometimes you have to say, not all religions are the same. You don't see the Catholic parish in Philadelphia making videos of six-year-olds talking about chopping off people's heads. You don't see the Methodists in Philadelphia making videos about chopping off people's heads and posting them to their Facebook pages. There are different religious views, and those different religious views create different cultures, and those different cultures have different politics. And you can't just assume that you can take one politics, the, the politics informed by, by chopping off people's heads, and throw it into the West, and it'll all be exactly fine, and it'll all be the same, and everyone will get along. No. That's not how it works. We're very open in the West, because our politics is formed by a real openness, by a real toleration. Not everybody agrees with those ideas. And to make an idol out of those, then, is to invite your own death, is to invite the destruction of those ideas themselves. It's cultural suicide. The left has very weird religious ideas. I don't know how I can make this point any clearer. You can forget about Islam. Just look at the religion of leftism. This was the clearest in Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib's colleague, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She sang a gospel song for the Green New Deal. It, and it's, it is truly the funniest video that has come out of politics in the last many weeks. But you can only see it if you go to dailywire.com. 10 bucks a month, $100 for an annual membership. You get me, you get the Andrew Clavin Show, you get the Men Shapiro Show, you get to ask questions in the mailbag, you get the Matt Wall Show, you get to ask questions backstage, you get Another Kingdom, you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. When we start playing that AOC gospel song, the Leftist Tears are going to flow. Go over to dailywire.com. We'll be right back.
the left has very strange religious ideas. I have said this for a while now, but the big takeaway watching this AOC video, the left not only perverts reality, the left inverts it. The left takes reality and exactly flips it on its head. It makes it opposite day every single day. The other point that is so clear that, again, I know we have all been intuiting this for years now, but it's so explicit here. Global warming is a false religion. It's not about science. It's not about scholarship. It's not about studies. It is a false religion with all the trappings of religion, including now, apparently, gospel hymns. Sunday before last, AOC shows up in a nice white shirt. She goes out with a group of these women, all wearing white, singing a gospel song. And across the post that she makes on Instagram, it says, hashtag Green New Deal. You are not going to believe the song she decided to sing in defense of the Green New Deal. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Did you catch those lyrics? There were only like two lyrics in the song. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Therefore, we need to protect the natural world. Hold on, wait a second, right? Let me go back. Ironically, <laughs> sometimes I think she's just trolling us at this point. Ironically, the song that AOC is singing in defense of the Green New Deal is the strongest argument there is against the Green New Deal. Her song that she's singing is, the, the joy that I have doesn't come from this world. This, this is a gospel song. It's called the, This Joy That I Have, and it's an old-timey gospel song. It's a great one. It's a song about spiritual endurance and grit and grace from God. It's saying... The joy that I have in my heart that animates me, that lifts me up, is not from this world. It's not from the trees. It's not from the birds. It's not from the sunset. It's not from my material wealth. It's not even from my health. It's not from any of the physical things of this world. This joy that I have comes from somewhere else. Now, you'll notice in the version that AOC is singing, they just keep repeating that. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. The actual song has many more lyrics to it. I'll just play you uh, one of them from uh, an excellent version of this song by Shirley Caesar. See if you can catch the word that AOC left out. Well, who gave it to you? What is this that you have, and who gave it to you? Nobody but Jesus, nobody but Jesus. But in the AOC version, she'd have to sing like, like, solar power, nobody but solar power, windmills, nobody but windmills. That's what she's talking about. Those paper straws, oh, definitely not plastic straws, paper straws. Because what AOC's fake false religion of global warming does is inverts true religion. This joy that I have tells me that everything in this world will pass away. Everything in this world is going to pass away. I'm going to die someday too. You all are. Hate to break it. Just spoiler alert. Every material thing that you really like, that new shirt that you bought that you think really looks good on you, your friends, your family, your kid, all of those things are going away. They are not going to last. One day the sun won't rise. This earth will pass. Our galaxy will pass. It's all going away. This joy that I have comes from eternal things that are outside of this world. They're from my salvation, my savior, my creator, the divine logic of the universe. Now, 
The point of that song is that we don't need to worry about the sufferings of this world. We don't need to worry about the natural and physical world at all. It's going to pass. We've got something eternal. And what AOC is singing is that we've got to care about the natural and physical world most of all because I'm singing part of a pretty gospel song. This is what the left always does. The, the left loves the appearance of beautiful things, but they hate what makes the things beautiful. So they they're all wearing white. White is a sign of purity. Since when does the left like purity? Since when does the left like modesty? The left goes on slut walks and shout your abortion walks. They don't like, but they like the imagery of purity. Since when does the left appreciate the gospel and gospel music and gospel songs? They don't believe in Jesus. They're substituting a false religion for the religion of Christianity, of Jesus. But they like, but they like, it looks good. Christianity, it's so pretty. It looks so good. Those gospel songs look good. The group she's singing with, the Resistance Revival Chorus, they actually sound pretty good. They are, quote, a collection of more than 60 women who come together to sing protest songs in the spirit of collective joy and resistance. So they're just far left wingers singing protest songs. But that is not a protest song. This joy I have is a gospel song. It's about the good news. What's the good news? That the world can't take this away because the world doesn't really matter. And what are they singing? Exactly the opposite. Everybody's got to serve somebody. Just keep that little song in mind. The next time some global warming alarmist comes up to you and says, you're denying science. Global warming is about science. It's about scientific studies. You're a science denier. Say, mm, I don't think that AOC singing this joy I have with a bunch of left-wing activists, I don't think that's very scientific. I don't, I don't think the Green New Deal is very scientific, is it? I don't think it's even really primarily about the environment. It's about a universal basic income. It's about socialist health care. It's about a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with the natural environment. This is what a culture that doesn't know itself does. We, we're born into this culture. Even the most radical left-wing people in our culture are born into it. And they, they kind of like it. They have a familiarity with it. They like the gospel songs. They like the white dress. They like the dancing around. They like that. They don't know what it means. They're just saying words. They don't know what they mean. I mean, in this case, she is literally, she might as well be singing, the Green New Deal doesn't matter, and I shouldn't care about global warming. The Green New Deal doesn't matter. And she's basically singing those words, but she, she doesn't hear them. She doesn't know what they mean. It is a senseless culture at this point that doesn't know itself, that's going through the motions without knowing what the motions mean. You see this perversity. You see this exact backwardsness. In, back, we got to go back to Pennsylvania, unfortunately. With uh, There's a, a Pennsylvania state representative, this guy Brian Sims, and he goes out to a Planned Parenthood, and he says that he's out there supporting women's rights. And how is he going to support women's rights? By harassing and mocking and ridiculing a woman who is expressing her political views. Here is this guy, this, this punk, this despicable punk, Brian Sims, going out on the streets right in front of a Planned Parenthood to harass a woman who was protesting the killing of babies. Hi everyone, uh, Representative Brian Sims here, and I'm once again out in front of Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, it's not only in my district, it's the most heavily protested Planned Parenthood, I, I believe, in the country, and today's protester. Now, she is an old white lady who's going to try to avoid showing you her face. Um, but the same laws, and luckily, that protect her from being out here also protect me from showing you who she is. And so my hope is, is that you'll donate $100 for every extra hour that this woman is out here telling people what's right for their bodies. So I have a couple questions for you, ma'am. How, how many children have you clothed today? I'm sorry, I missed your answer. How many children have you clothed today? How about how many children have you put shoes on their feet today? Have you fed any children today? Or have you just stood out in front of a Planned Parenthood shaming people for something that they have a constitutional right to do? Huh? If you're here about the children, you can pray at home for children. It's probably the same place that you could feed a child, but you're not. Instead, you're out here shaming people for something that they have a constitutional right to do. Who would have thought that an old white lady would be out in front of a Planned Parenthood 
telling people what's right for their bodies. Shame on you. Shame on you for hiding your face at the same time that you're shaming other people. So this guy obviously has some presumably pretty bad psychological problems. He's an elected politician in Pennsylvania. He's got a lot of bad philosophical and political and I suspect religious problems too. So his, do you hear his premise? So he goes up and he says, how many kids have you clothed today? How many kids have you bought shoes for today while you were protesting? The point is, if you think that it's wrong to kill babies, you also need to buy clothing for lots of little kids, which is a complete non sequitur. That doesn't make any sense. You can, it is perfectly reasonable to think that you shouldn't murder babies and also that their parents should take care of them and like not me. But, but beyond that, study after study shows Republicans, right wingers, give significantly more to charity than left wingers do. This has been shown time and time again. It's true of individuals, it's true of counties, it's true of states. There was a 2012 study that showed that the eight most generous states, the states that gave the highest percentage of their income to charity, all voted for the Republican in 2008. And the seven least generous states, the ones that give the lowest percentage of their income to charity, all voted for the Democrat in 2008. So even if his premise were true, which it's not, that if you think we shouldn't kill babies, you also should donate to charity. All the people who think we shouldn't kill babies donate more to charity than the people who think we should kill babies. Even that is wrong. But do you know what the major determining factor is here? Is religion. So a lot of these studies show it's not exactly just political preferences. It's that political preferences come from cultural ones, which come from religious ones. And it's the religion that is dictating the charitable giving, which of course makes sense. The, the impulses that I have to give to charity are informed by my religion. I suspect yours are too. If you think that life is some cosmic joke, that it doesn't mean anything, it's all random, that suffering and pleasure and pain, they're all just sort of illusions, that my pleasure is in no way less important than your pain, why would you ever give your money to somebody else? Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. The whole world doesn't make sense under that strange religion. But religion is the factor. And this guy, Brian Sims, posted on Twitter all of these anti-Christian screeds. He said, all you Bible bullies don't want to kill kids, but you know, you should. Something like that. Christians give much more to charity. The most charitable organization in the history of the world, by far, I mean, there is no second place, is the Catholic Church. It's not the Atheist League of Southeastern Pennsylvania. It's not the Democrat House of Representatives in Pennsylvania Club. It's the Catholic Church. Those Bible bullies, well, those Christians give much more to charity. But then the biggest irony, I love this so much in the video, as he's harassing this poor woman for nine consecutive minutes, is he decides to show what, what real feminism looks like. Thank you so much for working in a place that respects and protects women. Thank you, love you, Thank you so much. So if you couldn't see it, that's Brian Sims turning to two men walking into Planned Parenthood, licking their chops, can't wait to get their hands on a couple new babies, two men walking in, and then this man turns to them and says, thank you for supporting women. Not like this old hag over here, not like this awful vicious hag whose face I'm screaming in and who I'm plastering on social media, this awful, awful broad. No, you men, you guys really know how to support women. And this awful hag is a real misogynist, huh? That's what he's saying. He's accused, he did this on Twitter later. He accused people who disagree with his tactic of harassing a woman, mocking her appearance, mocking her age, plastering her on social media. He accused those of us who criticize that of misogyny, of hatred of women. This guy, Brian Sims, is the face of misogyny. This is what misogyny looks like. But it's that same, it's that ba backwards day, opposite day. They can't see it. It's why I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is trolling us sometimes. Is she says things that are the opposite of the argument she thinks she's making, but she doesn't realize it. Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, they're talking about freedom. They're talking about justice. They're talking about defense. They're talking about oppression. And yet they are seeing the situation exactly backwards. The violent aggressors 
they are defending as the victims. The victims they are accusing as the oppressors. The rogue state that elected a terrorist organization, it's not a state, the, the, it's a random area that elected a terrorist organization, they want to turn into a state. And yet the legitimate state, the Western-style democracy in the Middle East, they smear as a rogue state. True religion, the left mocks. False religion, hopeless religion, the, the religion of matter, the religion of stuff, the religion of this world, the left exalts as the, the pinnacle of science and hope. They, they might, the, the left should have been singing in that song, this, this joy that I have, the the world gave it to me, the world gave it, and I guess the world can take it away. Uh-oh, better watch out. They use the word misogyny to mean the opposite of misogyny. They use the word, the phrase pro-woman to mean the opposite of pro-woman. It's exactly the opposite. And is it, is it exactly the opposite because they're making a slight political miscalculation? Is it exactly the opposite because, oh, they got their tax rates a little bit wrong? Oh, they, they, underestimated economic growth in the third quarter. Yeah, they, they thought that this one ally would have a stronger response to a provocation. No, it has nothing to do with that basic politics. Their political miscalculations, their political errors are fundamentally religious errors. That's how they go so wrong. We were talking about this last week a little bit, how the phrase you can't legislate morality doesn't make any sense because all legislation ultimately refers to the moral law. Whenever we use the phrase fairness, justice, equality, we're, we're referring to moral terms. Even tax rates pay their fair share. We're talking about moral terms. And so at the very bottom, when you, if you make a moral error, if you make a religious error, then your political error is going to be so magnified. If you make a religious error, then your political error could be, it could be the exact opposite of the point that you want to make. If you think that God is a God of sense, logic, the divine logic of the universe, perfect goodness, maximal greatness, that is going to lead to a certain culture and to a certain politics. If you think that God is a God of pure will, that God is not bound in any way by logic, that God does not necessarily have anything to do with logic, that's going to lead to another kind of politics. And if you believe, as the religion of leftism does, that God doesn't really exist at all, you know, we're all sort of God, man. This whole world is God. Mother Nature is God. Gaia is God. Ultimately, I'm my own God. If you believe that, you are going to have probably the most perverse politics of all, but it's going to be the funniest one because it's exactly backwards. It's singing gospel songs to nothing. <laughs> singing gospel songs without the gospel. Gospel songs without the good news. Before we go, we only have a couple minutes left, I have to talk about this Facebook banning. There was a major ban on Facebook that happened. We were off the air on Friday. They banned InfoWars, Alex Jones, Louis Farrakhan, Laura Loomer, Paul Nealon, Paul Joseph Watson, Milo Yiannopoulos. The other social media sites have banned a lot of other people as well. This is terrible. There is no defense of this. There is, and look, some of these guys are pretty bad hombres. Louis Farrakhan obviously is a horrific man, a, a vicious bigot terrible guy, probably had a hand in the killing of Malcolm X. This is a, a bad guy. Paul Nealon is a white supremacist. He ran for Congress in Wisconsin. Milo Yiannopoulos, everyone has seen Milo Yiannopoulos' ups and downs and pitfalls and bad decisions. Some of these guys are, are basically mainstream or, or or, perfect, or at least innocuous. Maybe they're a little quirky or they're a little odd. You know, Paul, Paul Joseph Watson works for InfoWars. InfoWars is a pretty eccentric place. But uh, Paul, Paul Joseph Watson is not a bigot. I've never seen any evidence that that guy's bigoted at all. I've never seen Alex Jones, you know, put on a Ku Klux Klan hood or, or join with a, a bunch of uh, bigots or violent people. I've done, I, you know, in the last few days, I've seen two members of Congress publicly defend violent terrorists who launched 700 missiles at a civilian population. 
I've seen two members of Congress do that. I never saw Alex Jones do that. I never saw Milo Yiannopoulos do that. I never saw Paul Nealon do that. I never saw Paul, Paul Joseph Watson do that. Laura Loomer. This is very calculated. What they are doing is they're mixing some truly bad people. You know, Louis Farrakhan is probably, probably the worst person on that list, and he's been the worst for a long time. They mix some really bad hombres in there to then take out the innocuous people like Paul Joseph Watson. What this is building toward is banning me, banning Drew, banning Matt, banning Ben, banning all of the big names in the mainstream right wing. And they're going to start and they'll say, what? It doesn't matter. Wait, look, we just took Milo Yiannopoulos is a fringe character. Okay, but why are you banning him? What's the point of banning him? Oh, look, InfoWars, it's free. You don't want to, you're not like InfoWars. Yeah, okay, but why, why are you banning them? It's an excuse because the left does not want conservative ideas to get out. And so they're going to muddy the waters. They're going to mix things up and they're going to hope that conservatives aren't going to defend Alex Jones. I will defend Alex Jones. I will defend Alex Jones being on any social media platform forever. I, and I will do it because there's no reason to take him off and because taking him off is just a, a hidden way to come after the rest of us. And any conservatives who remain silent are, are just appeasing that little crocodile, hoping that it will eat them last. That's our show. Come back tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you then. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Rebecca Dobkowitz and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Danny D'Amico. Audio is mixed by Dylan Case. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. Hey guys, over on the Matt Wall Show today, a United States Congresswoman um, has taken the side of terrorists, and she even referred to, and, and I quote here, she said, our Palestinian people, our. I want to talk about that statement, and I'll explain why I think it warrants an investigation into this woman. Um, also, a Democratic state representative harassed an elderly woman, an elderly pro-life woman, and he was so proud of himself for doing so that he recorded it and put it online. So we'll play a clip of that and talk about it, and I'll answer your emails today over on The Matt Walsh Show.